We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. So glad that you are with us in God's house this morning. We are in the middle of a series going through the book of Job, so I want to encourage you to grab a copy of God's Word, open it to the book of Job. It's about in the middle of your Bible. And by the way, if you don't own a Bible, we're going to fix that right now. Just grab one from under the chair in front of you, write your name in it, and take it home with you, all right? It's the best book you could ever read and ever own, and we want you to have that. Uh, So right now, as a church, we're going through the book of Job together, and we're exploring this true story about a real guy named Job and and all the things that happened to him and the conversations that were taking place we covered last week. And today, we're going to meet someone new in this story, a brand new character entering into the story of Job. Uh, There's a a show I enjoy watching on television called uh, What Would You Do? Have you ever seen of this or heard of this show? Uh, It's basically a a show that requires eavesdropping. If you think of any any in here really good at eavesdropping, you're like a pro at it. Uh, If if you're being honest, right, there's some of you in here that there's moments in your life where you're having a conversation with someone that you're supposed to be listening to, and you look at them and you're like, shh, because there's another conversation happening near you that's far more interesting, right? (laughs) You're thinking, hold on, like pretend like you're still talking to me, but I'm paying attention to this other conversation. Well, in this, in this show called What Would You Do, that they, they put people in awkward situations or weird situations where it really requires there to be somebody who's off a little bit away from the main conversation, eavesdropping in, and then to hear what's going on to see, will they stop? Will they input their, their themselves into the situation and add some, some wisdom into the nonsense that's happening in front of them? Well, that's what is about to happen right here as we're now going into Job chapter 32. We get to meet a new guy named Elihu. Can you say that with me? Elihu. Elihu is a young guy, and he was there for the entirety of the conversation that Job has had with his three friends, right? They've been having these conversations back and forth from chapter 4 all the way through chapter 31, and Elihu is off a little bit in the distance, but close enough that he can hear the entirety of the conversation. He's eavesdropping, and it gets to a point where he is just done listening. He's ready to go and input himself into the conversation to say, enough, enough of this nonsense, Job, your friends are saying a bunch of stuff, and they're making a bunch of assumptions, and none of it is true. And Job, you're saying a bunch of stuff, and you're believing some things, and you're letting your feelings lead you down some really uh, silly thoughts, and none of that is true either. And I've I've got to step in, and I've got to say something. We see Job in chapter 32, verse 2. It says, Then Elihu, this new guy, the son of Barakel the Buzite, from the clan of Ram, He became angry. He was angry because Job refused to admit that he had sinned and that God was right in punishing him. He also was also angry with Job's three friends, for they made God appear to be wrong by their inability to answer Job's arguments. And so Elihu is done listening. He goes into this conversation and he says, everybody stop. I've got something to say. Now what you're going to learn is that if you, if you, uh, follow or listen to some sermons about Elihu, listen to a podcast, uh, other pastor's opinions about this guy, he he has kind of a reputation that's all over the map. Some people really love Elihu and everything he has to say. Other people talk about how he can be kind of arrogant and brash and kind of he steps in with this attitude. And some people love him. Some people hate him. Some people love to hate him. Some people hate to love him. And so you're really like... (laughs) What's going on with this Elihu? What what should we think about everything that he's about to input into the conversation? Have you ever met someone who is 
so confident that some people love them because of how confident they are. And other people look at them and they see that confidence as arrogance. And so they have a hard time liking this person because they come across as like a, an arrogant person. Well, well, Elihu is kind of like that. He's coming up after a period of being quiet, he's entering himself into a conversation that he wasn't originally a part of. He's angry, not just at Job and not just at the three friends, but at the whole conversation. He's, he's, he's definitely long-winded, okay? He's about to make the longest speech of all the speeches we've seen in the book of Job. Elihu's been probably taking notes. He's back there thinking, oh man, if I were, if I were part of this conversation, I would have said this and I would have said that. I would have said that. Why are they not saying this? Why? They should have called that play. They should have done this, right? He's sitting there back, back there listening and eventually he's had enough. And so now he's going up with a lot of confidence, this young guy talking to a bunch of older men and he's like, listen, I've got something to say and you guys need to listen. Here's actually... What he says, uh, starting in verse 7 of chapter 32, he says, I thought, you know, those who are older should speak, for wisdom comes with age. But there is a spirit within people, the breath of the Almighty within them, that makes them intelligent. Sometimes the elders are not wise. Sometimes the aged do not understand justice. So listen to me and let me tell you what I think. So young little Elihu puts himself into this conversation with Job and his friends. And some people think he comes in a little bit arrogant. Some people think he comes in a little confident. But here's the deal. Whether you love Elihu or you don't. Now, I don't think Elihu, my personal opinion, I don't think he gets everything exactly right in what he's about to say. But what I do know, and we're going to cover this next week, is that when God enters into the conversation, he's got some rebuke for Job, and he's got some rebuke for Job's three friends. He's got nothing to say to Elihu. That should tell us something. Elihu comes in, and he finally adds some sense. He, he, he connects some of the dots, how everyone's feeling with what is true, and he helps everyone see some things that we might have missed. And so for that reason, again, I don't think Elihu had everything right. But I think Elihu is going to bring some answers into the conversation that's been going on. And God had nothing to rebuke about what he had to say. So let's explore this guy named Elihu. Who is he? What did he want to say? You know, one of the things I love about Elihu before we get into my four points is I love that Elihu was not, uh, he, he didn't care about appeasing one side of the argument or the other. He wasn't coming in to say, I'm going to side with these guys or I'm going to side with Job. He came in with one intention, which is to side with the truth. I want you to understand truth is not a respecter of persons. Elihu's about to make everybody mad in the conversation, right? He's not trying to make, uh, pick sides and make friends. He's trying to find the truth, and I can respect that about him. In fact, he says in Job 32, verse 21, he says, I won't play favorites or try to flatter anyone. And so when Job says this, what he's simply saying is, it doesn't really matter what any of you think about me when I'm done speaking. I'm going to speak what I believe to be true. I'm not playing favorites. I'm just trying to find the truth. Now, at the very top of your notes, you're going to notice that there's really three different perspectives that we're now seeing. After Elihu speaks, there's three perspectives. Uh, and two of them lead to a kind of a bad place, and Elihu finally connects us to something good. You see, Job's friends, their perspective of justice is, has been so far, right, that bad things happen to bad people. Bad things happen to bad people. Real quick, raise your hand in this room if you are a sinner, all right? So this would be really bad news, right? Job's friends say, hey, bad things happen to all you sinners. And your pastor is a sinner too, right? All of us, we're broken people. We're messed up. And so if that's the answer, if this is God's version of justice, is that bad things happen to bad people, and that's it. That's the end of the story. Simple as that. That's not, that's not good news. That's bad news for all of us. Job has a perspective as well. When he's trying to figure out the justice of God, his perspective is that God doesn't seem to care what happens to people. 
but he's in charge. So, you know, God's just and God's good and God, you know, all the things, the anchors we talked about last week, God should be feared. So at the end of the day, it, he doesn't really seem to care much about me, but it is what it is. He's God and I'm not. And that's what Job's saying. And I want you to know that's also crummy news. To have a God to, to come and can you imagine if we came and worshiped a God who could care less about us? That's certainly bad news. So Elihu is coming in with a new perspective. And he's saying, listen, I want you to know, Job, I want you to know, Job's friends, that God does care and God is fair. And at the end of the day, thank God, because that's going to bring with it some really good news. So we're going to get to hear some good news finally in the book of Job. So these are the three perspectives. I want to zoom in on, on Elihu's perspective today. What does Elihu want each of us to know? What does he want Job and his friends to know? Here's the first thing I want you to write down in your notes. What does Elihu want you to know? Number one is that God cares about you. He's saying to Job, you've come to a conclusion that God isn't concerned with what's going on in your life. You've come to a conclusion that God doesn't care about you, that he's aloof, that he's up in heaven, he's not even paying attention, uh, that when you speak to him, he's not listening and has no desire to answer you. Job, that's where your feelings have taken you, and I want you to know that isn't true. God does care about you. There was one time my wife and I and my girls, we went to Olive Garden. It was probably five years ago, maybe even more, maybe 10 years ago now. We went in, and the host took us to our table, and we sat down, and like five minutes went by, and nobody came and said anything. Nobody asked what drinks we wanted or brought us you know, bread or anything, and but no big deal. It's probably a little busy. And 10 minutes go by, nothing. 15 minutes go by, still nothing. Now, a lot of people by now, you'd say, well, they probably, uh, we probably should just say something. It's like, excuse me, could we, you maybe, I don't know, you probably would have said something. Well, I, I decided to see, I'm like, let's not say anything. I'm just curious how long we could sit here without anybody noticing that nobody is waiting on this table. And so we waited 20, 25, 30 minutes. We had a great conversation as a family. We weren't super hungry, so it wasn't the end of the world. And eventually I'm like, you know what? Clearly there's a problem. There's a communication breakdown somewhere. No server was assigned to this table. Or if they were, they didn't hear about it. And so nobody's going to wait on us until we say something. Well, here's how we felt, right? How would you feel if for 30 minutes at a restaurant... Nobody came and waited on you or asked you how you were doing or brought you bread or drinks or anything, right? You would feel like the restaurant doesn't care about you, that you're not important to them, they've got other priorities, and that you can just sit there and tell their, you know, that's how it felt. It felt like they didn't care about us. Now, at the end of the day, I'm sure they did care. I'm sure they, if they, the manager realized we'd been sitting there for five minutes without anybody saying anything to us, that was against a policy of some sort, right? But it felt a certain way. And this is exactly how Job has expressed in all of his speeches to his friends how he feels. And so Elihu says to him in Job 33 verse 13, he says, so why are you bringing a charge against him? Why say that he does not respond to people's complaints. What Elihu is saying to Job is you're sitting there saying that God doesn't care, that God's unaware, he has nothing to say, he doesn't want to say anything, and God is just, he doesn't care about you. But that's not the reality, and Elihu wants Job to know about this. The best example I can give you that will maybe connect with, uh, help us connect this idea. I have a six-pound dog named Mabry. She's tiny. She's full-grown, right? She's not a puppy anymore. That's her, that's her full-grown size, all right? And that's why she doesn't sleep in bed with us because I'm afraid I'd wake up in the morning and she'd be dead, right? She's a small little thing, but she is a, like a little ball of anxiety. Everything about everything scares this dog. She's constantly shaking and she's scared and she, and so one of the worst experiences is every six months when we have to take her to the groomer. And the way the groomer works, we got to go in the morning, you know, first thing, and we drop Mabry off 
And, and, and when I'm walking into this place, she knows now where she's at, and she immediately starts shaking. I don't want to hold her anywhere near me because she'll empty her bladder right then out of fear, right? So she pees all over the floor, and they know this. They, they're ready to clean up after her every time. And she just looks at you, right? You're handing her over, and she's just staring like, why are you doing this to me? Like, you're, you're allowing me again. I'm gonna, they're going to put me in a little box back there, and I'm going to be there all day away from the people I care about, and I don't know any of these people. And to her, it feels like she's being abandoned, that I don't care about her, that I, I, I'm glad to, to put her in a situation where she's going to be in pain and, and fearful and anxious. And that's how she feels in that moment. I'm sure of it. But you all know that the reason you take your dog to the groomer it's because you love your dog. You want to make sure that your dog doesn't get matted hair and get unhealthy and get dirty and sick and, and, and the, the nails don't get overgrown. And there, there's things, right? You've got to take your dog to the groomer. And this is how I think God often works with us. There's times where God, the way I wrote it down, listen, you may feel like God is disinterested, but I want you to know he's very involved. Sometimes God chooses or allows you to be hurt because he loves you. Sometimes God allows hard things to happen in your life. He allows you to be in a situation where you feel like he doesn't care, he's not listening, he's distant, he doesn't, uh, uh, he's not even concerned with the pain that you're experiencing. And that's how you're feeling. But maybe he's just taking you to the groomer. And then he's got something really good for you going on in this mix. You see, sometimes God is communicating something very important to you through silence. Sometimes God is speaking very, very loudly to you, something that you would never hear unless he got really, really quiet in your life. And what Elihu is trying to say to Job is, Job, quit making accusations that God doesn't care. He does care. Let me show this to you in, in some of Elihu's words. Job 35, verse 13. Job says, but is it wrong? Sorry, but yeah, it is wrong to say God doesn't listen, to say the Almighty isn't concerned. That's real simple. I could stop right there. Elihu says, Job, listen, it's wrong for you to make an assumption that God isn't listening to you and that God isn't concerned by what's happening to you. It's wrong. We keep reading in verse 15, it says, but you say he doesn't respond to sinners with anger and is not greatly concerned about wickedness, but you are talking nonsense, Job. You have spoken like a fool. Now, I will be the first to admit that when bad things happen in my life, when I'm in a season of suffering, it tends to bring about some really silly thoughts. I start to believe things that aren't true, say things that aren't true, and that's what's happening to Job. He's saying some things that aren't real, and Elihu's stepping in to say, stop it. God does care. In fact, we see the truth in Job 33. These are also Elihu's words. In verse 14, it says, for God speaks again and again, though people do not recognize it. He speaks in dreams, in visions of the night, when deep sleep falls on people as they lie in their beds, he whispers in their ears and terrifies them with warnings. He makes them turn from doing wrong, and he keeps them from pride. See, what Elihu is saying is, I want you to understand that sometimes God isn't saying anything because he doesn't want to say anything, but he's there, he's listening. But sometimes he says something, and you just don't hear him. Sometimes God is speaking to you, but you're not listening and you see, when, when the book of Job was written, this is before Scripture, right? Now we have so many other ways to listen to God speak to us. We can, God can still speak to us in dreams and visions. He can send us a word in, in any way he wants. He's God. He can do that. But now we know that God continues to speak to his people. He speaks to us through his word. He speaks to us through the Holy Spirit that lives in those who have decided to follow Jesus he speaks to us through other believers, brothers and sisters in Christ. In fact, we learn in, in Psalm 19, verses 1 and 2, that he speaks to us through his creation. And so everywhere you look, believer, you might feel like God doesn't care, but I want you to know that God 
is listening and God is speaking to you and you might feel like, you, you, like my dog that's been put in a kennel all day in a scary situation that you don't like. But the truth is that God cares about you and he loves you. That's the first thing Elihu wants Job to know and wants you to know. Here's the second thing. Number two is that the holiness of God demands consequences for sin. The holiness of God demands consequences for sin. The first thing I want you to understand is that the Bible teaches us that God is holy, that there is no wrong in him, that he's never sinned, that God is perfect. Right? One great example of that is when Jesus uh, says in John, he says, which of you can truthfully accuse me of sin? Jesus is like, I, I dare you. One of you try to find one thing that I've ever done that I wasn't supposed to do. You see, Jesus, the son of God, he came and lived a perfect life. God alone is, is truly holy, right? The problem is you all raised your hand earlier and told me that you are not. And what Elihu is trying to say to Job is, Job, I want you to understand that you live in a broken world because of sin, and that you, Job, are not free of sin. You've actually contributed to the brokenness of this world. And so if you are surprised that bad things happen to people in a broken world, you need to wake up. You need to wake up if, if the bad, crummy things that happen in this world around you are surprising to you. Let me show you an area where I think Job is really missing the holiness of God. In Job 34, verses 5 and 6, Elihu says, For Job, you also said, I am innocent, but God has taken away my rights. Whew. I'm going to think about that for just a second. Job goes on to say, I am innocent, but they call me a liar. My suffering is incurable, though I have not sinned. Now, in fairness, I know that Job knows that he's a sinner. There's other scripture where Job has said, uh, am I still being punished for the sin of my youth? Job knows that in his younger days, he had some issues just like you and I do probably this morning, right? But what Job understands, what he's trying to say is in this season of my life, where I am right now, uh, he's trying to tell his friends, I'm not doing anything right now in my life that I need to repent of. I've repented of my previous sin. That stuff's behind me. I'm not living currently in this bondage of sin that you guys keep accusing me of. That's what he's trying to say. But do you hear what he says? He says, God has taken away my rights. I want you to know, Elihu wants Job to know, Elihu wants you to know that if you are a sinner in a world full of sin, where all of us are broken people that live in a broken world, none of us deserves everything to go well. We live in a broken world. I mean, you think about some of the things that happened to Job, right? Bad people, because of sin, came in and they stole his oxen and his donkeys and his camels, and they stole all the workers that, that work with those animals. All of them, because of sin, because Job lives in a broken world, theft happened and he lost all of that. Also because of sin, you can trace this all the way back to the Garden of Eden because of the sin that we all inherited. This world is now a broken place. And that also means creation is broken. We now experience natural disasters and volcanoes and earthquakes and hurricanes and all sorts of things that happened that wouldn't have happened if we lived in a world that was the way it was back in Genesis chapter 1. But because of storms, Job lost all of his sheep. He lost all of his shepherds. And then a windstorm came by and blew in the sides of the walls of his kid's house. And he lost all 10 of his children. All because the world and creation is groaning because of sin. And then all the, the disease that Job is experiencing. Right? He's got boils on his skin. He wishes he would die. Disease, pain, death, all of those things exist because sin is part of the human experience. All of us live in a broken world. And Elihu is saying to Job, hold up. If you really think that you somehow have a right 
to, to being uh, free of all those things, then I think you miss the holiness of God. All of us have contributed to this brokenness and none of us should be surprised by it. And a lie who brings a real sense of understanding around that truth. You know, the, his friends had said something along the lines of, God never lets bad things happen to good people. You know what's missed kind of in that understanding? That none of us are good. <laughs> There's not a single one of us. Scripture says that not one of us in this room is good. So whatever happens, whatever pain, whatever suffering we experience, even if we're in a season where we're not living in, in repetitive, unrepentant sin, we shouldn't be surprised by the broken world around us. Sickness, disease, murder, rape, theft, natural disasters, even death, all these things are a result of sin. One way to think about this is we all, again, going back to the Garden of Eden, when God created the world, it was perfect. We had the, the ability to live in it without any natural disasters, without any pain, without any war, without any theft, without any sin. It was a perfect experience. And then God just said, don't eat from this tree, Adam. Don't eat from this tree, Eve. Right there in Genesis chapter 2, everything falls apart. They go and they, they take and they eat, from, uh, they eat from the tree they're not supposed to. And we all have inherited this thing now called a, a sin nature. In other words, all of us have a, a bend to us. If, if, if straight means that all of us are doing things exactly the way God would have us do them, none of us is straight in this room. We are all bent. We are all naturally inclined in our human nature to do things away from the way that God would want us to do them. We have to be intentional. We have to desire to do things God's way. We got to work to, to realign our lives with God's because we have a sin nature in us. And so what Elihu is saying to us, listen, don't be surprised in this world when you experience suffering and pain and sickness and disease and loss and death and all those things. This, this is a broken world. That's what sin did. Here's the third thing. Number three, Elihu wants you to know that because God is holy, that only he is truly just. Because God is holy, and he's the only one who's holy, it really another way to say this is because God alone is holy, God alone is truly just. Not one of us in this room can fully grasp justice because all of us are broken. We're all bent, right? We're we're, we're, we don't have a, a perfect grasp on anything the way God does. He created it all, and he did it perfectly, and he is perfect. So only he has a perfect path of justice. And so Job's friends are trying to understand the justice of God. Job is trying to understand the justice of God. And Elihu comes forward and says, listen, you guys all got it wrong. Only God knows what is truly just and right. And you guys are trying to figure it out. In Job 36, verse 23, Elihu says, no one can tell him, that's God, nobody can tell God what to do or say to him, you have done wrong. Not a single one of us in this room can go up to God and say, hey God, the way you handled this situation, it wasn't fair. You did it wrong. Not a single one of us can say, God, that thing that happened to me or someone else I know or care about, that wasn't just. Not a single one of us can. Because God is holy and perfect. He alone knows what should and shouldn't happen in our lives. Because God is perfect, his version of justice is also perfect. I want you to understand this. Because God is perfect, his version of justice is also perfect. Here's how he says this. In Job 34, Starting in verse 10, if you want to read with me, I'm going to read nine verses. Job says, listen to me, you who have understanding. Everyone knows that God doesn't sin. The Almighty can do no wrong. He repays people 
according to their deeds. He treats people as they deserve. Truly, God will not do wrong. The Almighty will not twist justice. Did somebody else place the world in his care? Who set the whole world in place? If God were to take back his spirit and withdraw his breath, all life would cease and humanity would turn again to dust. Now listen to me if you are wise. Pay attention to what I say. Could God govern if he hated justice? Are you going to condemn the almighty judge? For he says to kings, you are wicked, and to nobles, you are unjust. He doesn't care how great a person may be. He pays no attention to the rich. More, uh, he pays no more attention to the rich than to the poor. He made them all. What Job is simply saying is God understands perfect justice. I have a, uh, a daytime show that if I'm ever homesick and I turn on the TV, it's kind of like... Um, a guilty pleasure television show that I enjoy watching. Anyone else enjoy Judge Judy? <laughs> really, any daytime court television, I love it. Now, I know a lot of it is kind of probably fake and it's not all super real and I don't know, but I, I love how Judy sits up on her bench, right? And she listens to both sides and she doesn't put up with a lot of nonsense and she puts people in their place and tells people when to speak and when to sit down and when to stand up and all all that, what she's doing, right? She's listening to two sides and she's got to take a situation where she wasn't there. She didn't witness what, was, what they're talking about and she's got to make a decision. Well, what Job or what Elihu is saying to Job, if you read just the next verse, I love this. In verse, uh, a couple verses, in verse 21, it says, for God watches how people live. He sees everything they do. You see, there is no trial that's necessary with God. There is no jury that is necessary with God. He was there. He watched exactly what went down. He knows all of your sin. Elihu is saying to Job, he knows what you did in your youth. He knows what you're struggling with now. He knows all your thoughts. Job's friends, he knows what's going on. He knows everything. He knows it all. And then check out verse, verse 33, the first part. It says, must God tailor his justice to your demands? Is God really supposed to, to figure out what you think is fair and then operate under that premise? Is he supposed to figure out, well, Matt didn't think this was a fair decision, so I better go revisit it. No. Elihu is saying to Job and his friends, quit trying to figure out or, or claim that you understand the justice system of God because only God and his system, it, it makes sense to him, and it's perfect because God's perfect. You're not going to fully make sense of it. Stop it. And can we just take a moment and thank God that he doesn't follow our system of justice? Think about that for a minute. If our system of justice is, man, bad things happen to bad people, that's what they deserve. Well, that's really crummy news for all of us. And thank God that he doesn't operate that way. He, he does, but he's got this, this system of justice. He, he thinks above that because remember point one, he cares about you. He loves you. So he's got a plan, right? So really the, the problem is if God cares and he is holy, and because God is holy and we're not, we're separated from God, then we got us ourselves a problem, right? And that leads to the fourth thing, Elihu wants you to know. Elihu wants Job to know, and it's this, that God saves those who can't save themselves. God saves those who can't save themselves. That's all of us in this room. Not a single one of us can save ourselves. And so we ought to be very thankful that because God cares about us and because we have sin that separates us from God, that he circles back around in his perfect system of justice and says, listen, you are incapable of fixing the problem you've put yourself in. But as a perfect arbiter of justice, God says, I've got a plan to save you because you can't save yourself. And what Elihu is about to do, he's about to give this little mini speech where he shares the gospel before the gospel even existed. Right? Before the Old Testament is even 
pinned down, Elihu comes in and he shares, I'm going to read this and you're going to be able to see Jesus in this. You're going to be able to see the gift of salvation in these verses. Job chapter 33, starting in verse 23, it says this, but if an angel from heaven appears, a special messenger to intercede for a person and declare that he is upright. Does that sound familiar to you? If a messenger from heaven comes down and intercedes for people who aren't able to fix things themselves, and that person has the power to declare that they are upright, it says he will be as healthy as, I'm sorry, he'll be gracious and say, rescue him from the grave, for I have found a ransom for his life. And then his body will become as healthy as a child's, firm and youthful again. When he prays to God, he will be accepted and God will receive him with joy and restore him to good standing. He will declare to his friends, I sinned and twisted the truth, but it was not worth it. God rescued me from the grave and now my life is filled with light. This is the gospel. Job is sharing with Sorry, Elihu is sharing with Job, and Elihu is sharing with Job's friends this is a powerful truth. And then he actually goes on. Let me, let me read the next part of this to you. Starting in verse 29, it says, Yes, God has done these things again and again for people. Would you do me a quick favor if you're in this room? If you're one of the people that God has done this for, would you raise your hands? If you're one of the broken people that could not be restored back to God because of your brokenness, but God sent someone as a ransom for you. Once again, will you put your hand up in the air? That's right. This, this church is full of people who have stories about how God and him sending his son ha has ransomed you from the grave, has bought you back, has redeemed you. And Elihu is saying, listen, we ought to be so thankful that God's system of justice isn't what you think it is. Because God in his perfect justice and in his perfect care for you, he's gonna send someone to save you because you can't save yourself. And he's trying to share this truth with Job even before the gospel existed. So what do we do with this church? What now? As we find ourselves with these four points we understand that God cares about us, that the holiness of God demands a consequence for our sin, and that that happens because God's system of justice is perfect because he's perfect. And because God has a perfect system of justice, because not a single one of us in this room should be permitted into heaven because if God allows a bunch of imperfect people like us into a perfect place like heaven, we immediately ruin the place. And so the problem is there's a gap. There's, there's no way that we can be restored to the Father uh, using our system. But God says, I got a system that's so, so much better than your system. I have a son who I'm gonna send to the earth and he's gonna live a perfect life that, that your pastor wasn't able to live that none of you were able to live. And I'm gonna allow anybody who wants to put their faith in my son to, to take my son as their Lord and Savior. I'm gonna allow my son's righteousness to be put on their tab. And I'm gonna take all their sin and brokenness and put it on my son's tab. And he's gonna pay for their sin on the cross. And anybody who believes in my son, one day as they stand before me, I'm gonna save those people who weren't able to save themselves through the death, burial, and resurrection of my son and their faith in him. See, if you were to ask yourself, what now, God? I would say there's two things I want you to heavily consider. The first one is if you're in this room and you've never given your life to Jesus, the most obvious what now, God, for you would be to give him your life. Let today be the day where you say, you know what, I recognize all the things that Elihu was trying to describe to Job. I recognize that God cares about me. I recognize that God is holy and that I am not, and that that causes a problem. And I recognize that God has a system of justice that's so much better than mine, that he sent his son to save me when I couldn't save myself. And by simply 
recognizing that and embracing that, you can start today a brand new relationship with Jesus Christ. In fact, after service, you can come find me or really anyone with a lanyard, any of our volunteers, and they might not know what to say or do, but they'll, they'll know how to find someone who does and say, I want to give my life to Jesus. How do I do that? Go to our next steps counter today and say, I want to give my life to Jesus. How do I do that? Come find me and say, I want to give my life to Jesus. How do I do that? I'd be happy to, man, that's, you, you make my day. I promise. Be the highlight of my Sunday. In Romans 12, verse one, it says, and so dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. See, in light of the the incredible system of justice that God has come up with, where he sent his son to pay the penalty for your, your brokenness, because he did that, what God's saying is, in light of that, you ought to give your life to him. It's the only thing that makes sense. And those, those of you in this room, you've already given your life to Jesus. Here's what I want to encourage you to do. In light of all of Elihu's wisdom, the second thing I want you to consider is to trust God with the rest. You give your life to him. And when you give something away, you don't like hang on to it. Right? Say, God, I'm going to put my life in your hands. Now, whatever you want to do with it, you want to take away everything you gave me, you can do that. You want to bless me, you can do that. You want to make me, uh, allow me to hurt for a little while because you got something better for me. You want to send me to the groomers for a minute and clean me up. You can do that. Whatever you want to do, I'm going to trust you with the rest of my life. I'm going to give my life to you. I'm going to trust you with the rest. I love how he, he puts it. In Job, I'm going to close with this verse, Job 36, verses 16 and 17. Here's what Elihu says. God is leading you away from danger, Job, to a place free from distress. He is setting your table with the best food, but you are obsessed with whether the godless will be judged. You're worried about all these other things, Job. You're concerned about things that are none of your business, frankly. He says this, but don't worry. Judgment and justice will be upheld. In other words, church, give your life to God. Trust him with the rest. Don't try to make sense of it if it doesn't make sense to you. God's good. All the anchors we talked about last week, and now add on to the truth that God cares about you, and he's got to do something about sin. And so he sent his son to save you who can't save yourselves. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this reminder that you love us. You do care about us. And sometimes it doesn't feel like you're paying attention. Sometimes it doesn't feel like you're listening, but we trust that you are. We know that you care about us deeply. You long to have an eternal relationship with every every single one of us in this room. And so you sent your son as a solution to our sin problem. All of us caused are part of this brokenness that we experience. It shouldn't be a surprise to us, but you sent Jesus to this earth and in a a justice system that only you can uh, uh, approve of, that only you can allow, that only you could have thought of, you sent your son to this earth, sent your son to this earth to substitute himself for us, for those who have placed our faith in him. We thank you that you God, would you give us the courage to trust you with our lives and not worry about the rest. It's great that we need us. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this. You belong at ACC.